Hey, it's Noah Khan. I just did an interview on the Zach Sang Show. We talked about mental health, trusting yourself, and uh, your life changing through some songs. Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach. That is Daniel. We welcome back to the couch. Noah Khan. Woo! Thanks for having me. I, I'm not going to lie. I really thought you forgot that you had been on our show before. Uh, it was the highlight of my entire life. How could I forget? That it? is fucking horse hockey. <laughs> is... I do remember. I remember the different studio, but I, I remember being on the show, and I was excited then, and I'm excited now. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, but like shit is a little different right now. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. How many songs do you think you wrote before you got Stick Season? Um, I wrote a song every day for two years, so, you know, I can't do the math. I don't think anyone can do that kind of math, but lots of songs, hundreds of tunes, Hundreds of songs I never saw the light of day, and you know, stick season almost didn't either. So I think I got to be more confident. So is that a part of the the skill when you write that many songs? Is being able to determine which one sticks out amongst the rest? Yeah, and honestly, I do have to credit TikTok in a lot of ways. Like a lot of times, you know, you write a bunch of songs and you wait to send them to your label, to your producer, and then that's kind of the determination for what goes on the record. But with Stick Season, it was very much a song born out of crowdsourced self-esteem and TikTok. And uh, I, I just wrote a little ditty and put it online and people responded to it. And that was what drove the, you know, that's what drove the promotion of the song that's what drove this the kind of the the finishing of it and the recording of it and it was definitely a crowdsource kind of thing but what pushed you to share in the first place i don't know i was just i was making music that i that i at one point in my life i really loved but i'd started to kind of fall out of love with i was recording my second record uh with an incredible producer um named Joel Little and we were recording it in LA at his place in Laurel Canyon and I was just kind of going home being like man I need to transition away um, from some of the more pop stuff it, it the the music I liked but the creation and the process of going into songwriting sessions and recording in LA I'd kind of I'd kind of fallen out of love with and so I was going back to my Airbnb every night and just writing little folk ditties really just like writing little stories about Vermont about my family about uh, my life back in the East Coast and uh, I started to just kind of put them on TikTok just to see what people thought you know I'd I was like, I'm never gonna release these. I might as well just put them up, and so people can have a way to listen to them. Uh, and people responded to them, and I was like, okay, there might be an audience for this kind of music. So this was like a, a, a session after the session, pretty much. Yeah, I, songwriting to me is so personal, and it felt like I had lost. I was kind of doing it as more of a job, and I felt like I was doing these sessions, and I couldn't wait to get home uh, so I could just write by myself because I I, I love writing songs for myself that. You know, it's an, a way I express myself and to be able to kind of have a way to have a release emotionally a jet that was just mine was really important to me and that's kind of what these se sessions after sessions were for me just a way to kind of unwind and write music that I could be proud of and that didn't feel like work. Does this new album start with six, Stick Season? It starts with a song called Northern Attitude. It's number The first song so is Northern great. Attitude yeah. and Stick Season is um, I think maybe somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, it, it was it was one of those things where we wanted to present a story, and it felt like Northern Attitude was the best way to start it. Uh, it kind of encapsulates the whole vibe of New England and small town. Um, but Stick Season is definitely the focus track that kind of ties the themes together. If the sun doesn't rise, uh, if the sun don't rise till the summertime, forgive my Northern Attitude. Uh, oh, I was raised on a little light. Do you really blame your crudeness or your rudeness or your toughness? As I am from New Jersey, yeah, on the East Coast? I think, it's, I think it's a part of it. I think I am kind of just a jackass, but I think that it doesn't <laughs> help that for six months of the year I'm sitting in my house freezing my ass off and warming my car up for 45 minutes. And and uh, people, the, the being, growing up in a place where it's cold, I truly do think has like a sociological impact oh, yeah. on how people behave and how people act. I think it, it implores a certain kind of reservedness, a, 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 br a bruff, or like a gruffness um, that is kind of layering over a really true kindness. I think people say, this is what people say about New England, that people in New England are not nice, but they're kind. I think people in New England, like, they'll change your tire for you if you're stuck on the side of the road, but they won't say a fucking word to you the entire time. And that's kind of how I feel like the, the vibe is in New England. Like people are freezing. We're trying to get to where we're trying to go. We're not trying to waste any time having casual, vapid conversation. But uh, the conversations you do have are meaningful and important because they're supposed to happen in those moments. Yeah, and they're, by the way, action. Absolutely. More than anything. Yeah. That is, so, uh, for lack of a better phrase, is it take time to chip away at the ice when you're in a relationship genuinely? I think so. I think there's not a lot of room for bullshit. Yeah. Um, 
I think in a relationship uh, and with New Englanders, like you get down to what is really important. What's important is what's going to be there because people don't necessarily have the time for anything else or or the patience a lot of times for any, anyone else. I come from a family of very impatient people mm-hmm. and um, I feel like I need to know who somebody is before I waste my time with anything else. And, you know, I hate the feeling that I might get to know somebody and they will um, not be the person that I thought they were. Uh, I like to know people and to feel like people know me. Uh, and that's um, important to me. What's the biggest difference between Northern Attitude and, uh, I, I don't know, any of the other records that you've put out since you last came on the show? I think the difference is they're a little bit more specific to my experience. I think I was always priding myself on like a universality and relatability and um I was in some ways restricting myself to certain ideas that I felt like were relatable and I maybe wasn't speaking to what was relatable to me. And, uh, you know, I went through a lot uh, in the years since we last talked, um, you know, in my in my life, in my job. And I started to, to think I need to write what's going on in my life specifically to what's going on in my life, where I am or else I don't feel like I'm actually expressing myself anymore. So it was important for me to be willing to be relatable and maybe alienating. Um, and what's been cool is to see that people have related to those things in themselves and that there's like a relatability and, and specificity um, and there's artists like Phoebe Bridgers and Sam Fender who have really paved the way for telling stories about their own lives in a specific way that does feel relatable and universal by the way so many artists there's so many artists that have sat on the couch literally said similar things to that but my question to you is you deep down knew that being specific would actually turn into something bigger but is it an ultimate fear to be so specific and revealing at the same at the same time definitely yeah it's 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 uncomfortable to 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 feel like you might not be connecting with people it's uncomfortable to be specific about your personal life and vulnerable, um, and vulnerable. you know there's an unco- a discomfort in um being vulnerable and and speaking about things that are tricky you know i talk about my folks divorce and my body image and i talk about my my fears and my substance abuse past um and i was so concerned going into this record to talk about those things and but i remember when i was a little kid and i would hear a song and the artist would say something that i felt like only i had ever felt in my life and it would change my entire week and i would walk around with a pep in my step because someone else in the world had finally understood what i thought was so alien to everyone else um and if i can provide that moment for somebody if i can make someone feel heard and not alone in the 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 shit that we go through every day um then that discomfort is so much it's so worth it it's worth it to feel a little uncomfortable if it makes someone feel happy and comfortable and safe in their skin is this a new gauge on whether or not a song could actually work do you feel uncomfortable while making it if i feel scared about what i'm saying if i feel uncomfortable if i sometimes cringe at the honesty that i'm trying to come to get through i do feel like it's a good song uh because Great, I mean, this is so arrogant, but I feel like great art is uncomfortable and and asks questions and makes you contemplate tricky things. I think um, to present no challenges is to present no uh, substance. So being challenged is uh, by lyrics, by songs, um, by the things I'm saying strikes me as a positive. Is that a new litmus test that you run songs through now that you didn't before? It is now. Yeah, it is now. I, I think this past record has just given me like so much confidence. I think I presented myself with a lot of confidence for a long time. I didn't really have any and didn't really know what I was doing. I I had like the worst imposter syndrome and I always felt like maybe people were going to find out that it's all just bullshit. And I was wondering if it was bullshit myself. Um, and this with this record, I really did be honest and uh, and it's had success. And so it makes me think now I have to approach every song with honesty and every session with honesty. Uh, by the way, to, to what you said about being understood, I feel very understood by this body of work. I really do. I play it all the time. Oh, uh, thank you. Whether you know Dan wants me to, wants to hear it all the fucking time or not. <laughs> Dan, you don't like this shit. Come no, on, I dude. do like it. He just he's probably your biggest fan. Just nah, plays yeah. it all the time. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia. All right, you get it, man. You guys are mean as hell. What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. When you were describing, <laughs> I was like, I fucking get it. It's the same thing. We call we call ourselves lovable assholes. Absolutely, absolutely. There's pride in that. Absolutely. There are a bunch of records on this album uh, that I really genuinely feel understood by. To your point, like you really hit the nail on the head in that. And there is so much relatability to uh, very specific things and very raw, vulnerable moments. As hard as it may be to share, it goes the longest way. And I don't know. It results in a real relationship that you're definitely feeling today i mean dude this this is easily your most successful body of work and 
comprised of your biggest hits so far, correct? Yeah, definitely. Uh, for sure, the most successful to date, which is really cool because I'm proud of it. Now, I, I, I you should you should be proud of it. You should be incredibly proud of it. Thanks. How many people are making folk music cool? Not many, man. I uh, I mean, there are so there are actually a lot of great artists that are doing it that have paved the way for me. So I I have to be grateful for a lot of artists, you know, contemporary and from you know my childhood, like Lumineers, Mumford and Sons. Those guys did pave the way, and there's a real bad rap that some of those guys got in the past like ten years. You know, corny guys and overalls, but <laughs> at at the core of it, it's great songwriting and storytelling, which is an American tradition. And you know, I'm grateful for artists like Camp, Mount Joy, Hosier. Sam Fender, Phoebe Bridgers for allowing that stuff to come back into the mainstream in a, in a really cool and evolved way. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be at all involved in the conversation of making folk music cool again. Dude, I think some of the greatest songwriters of our time started as folk artists. Totally. Skylar Gray, coolest motherfucker. Writes for Dr. Dre, mm -hmm. Celine Dion, and Eminem. Who the fuck can do that? Only somebody who knows that the story tells you folk, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And also, like, you can go way back and trace those lines of folk music so, so far. Fucking Simon and Garfunkel. You can go so oh, far. Yeah. Neil Young, folk grunge, motherfucker. Oh, yeah. Like, that is... Cat Stevens, Yes. Man. Honest. Yeah. I mean, do you, like, can I be, like, you, you, the, the names you just... Phoebe Bridgers, is that... Cons do you consider her folk? I consider her a storyteller, and I think folk music is the ultimate storytelling. Um, so I think there is a connection. I don't... I don't... I almost feel like... If we can just make a genre called storytelling, that would be wonderful <laughs> because Phoebe Bridgers is a storyteller, Sam Fender is a storyteller, and I think some of the songs on my record, you know, that's not always banjo, there's not always acoustic guitar, but there's a story in each tune. So those are artists that I consider, uh, you know, icons in terms of what I when I look at storytelling. Um, so I don't know if I consider her folk. I don't know if she considers herself folk, but uh, she was inspirational nonetheless. Do you did you find folk or did folk find you? Folk found me, man. I grew up. My mom is just the most, and my dad have the most amazing taste in music. You know, I, I grew up and they would be playing, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, Cat Stevens, Counting Crows, just amazing Ooh. storytelling of the Counting Crows, man. Oh my gosh, underrated. Um, you know, into like the Avett Brothers and Gregory Allen Isakov and these people that transport you to a place and time and that take you into their lives. And that music really shaped me. And, you know, growing up in, in a small town, like I was bored to shit all the time. And so I was always trying to be creative and like create a, an escape for myself and artists that like 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 those artists that I mentioned provided a great escape and really like set the standard for what it means to uh, take a listener somewhere else and so that kind of having that music in the home growing up was really influential and I you know I found myself doing more pop as I started out uh, but in a lot of ways I was always kind of ending up here uh, from from what I listened to in my childhood and by the way, like you can also hear it in the music you were putting out before. Like, mm -hmm. dude, that Quinn ninety two record it gives really deep storytelling. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm blanking for some reason on your first hit, but I can hear it in my fucking head. Yeah, that hurt somebody. Yeah, yeah. That's, I uh, mean, Julia Michaels. The Julia Michaels. Yeah, the Julia Michaels track. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there was definitely always like simplicity. Like, great folk music is simple. Totally. And so I was always approaching the songwriting from that angle. I think it was just. You know, the world I found myself in doing co-writes in L.A. or co-writes in New York where there's a lot of these pop writers and I kind of felt like, all right, this is what I should. It should be a little pop because I got to stay in this lane. And then I was like, I don't have to actually have to do anything that I don't want to do. I can just go make folky music, you know. Do you consider like when you think of pop music, is that attached to the lyrics and how they're arranged or is it the sonics? I think it's a restriction of what I'm able. Like, I think with pop, great pop music is really simple. Um sonically simple in a lot of ways maybe there's a few different things going on but um i feel like it's really just about how much you can get into specifics i think what's great about great pop music is immediacy and universality and mm -hmm. i think sometimes that feels like it restricts the idea of venturing into a different world or venturing into a story that might you know take people a little bit longer to digest so what does it take for a folk song to be pop um oh that's a great question I think it needs to have some kind of grand universal theme, particularly in a chorus. I also think like big anthems happen in folk music and pop music. And so like a big anthemic chorus can bring it into the pop space. Uh, you know, like the song Stick Season, I feel like has an anthemic enough melody and chorus. Like melody is so important in a pop song uh, that it can kind of move into that world a little bit. Um, but lyrically stays in a place that's more folk driven. Are you happy that you wrote? 700 800 songs in two years whatever it is yeah um i am happy i did that i i grew up writing every day it's just like my escape and it's also 
I am a fundamental believer in, in like that your writing is a real muscle and that you have to exercise it every day. And that if you don't, is it like a use it or lose it kind of thing? So, you know, I wrote so many bad songs and I live and die by each song I write. And that means a lot of bad days. Um, but every single bad song I wrote brought me to the good ones. Um, as kind of boring as an answer that is, but it is the truth. Like I needed to write a bunch of shit to get to the uh, to get to the good stuff. What do you say to the artists that believe songs are given by a higher power and it's not a muscle? They don't control it. It's about being open to it, and it just comes. Well, I think I would love to look at an artist that believes that uh, from the beginning to ten years later, and and uh, how much that that logic has worked out. I think it's. I think there is there are songs that come out of nowhere that feel God given and um, feel special and sometimes those songs do connect but I think in terms of longevity you need to be able to get better at your craft and to work on your craft I think it's incredibly important to be writing every day and you know for me this is a it, it, in a lot of ways it's a job it's also a passion it's it's making sure that I'm doing the work and not resting on my laurels and waiting for the next thing to come I I just have a need for like control of my life and uh, and that means every day waking up and doing something that moves me forward and that's writing songs do you do you think a part of like why this music is finding at least a, a home playlist wise just because like I mean yes it's TikToking out the ass it's streaming yeah. out the ass but there's support more than just stick season mm -hmm. like growing sideways is making a bunch of playlists northern attitude is making a bunch of playlists is there a hole in music for this sound um I don't know I don't know I think people's barometer for bullshit is pretty high right now. I think that's a, a cool thing about TikTok is people have been able to appreciate lyrics and are able to, are interpreting songs and really looking at what the lyrics mean. And, and again, to go back to artists like Phoebe Bridgers, like people, she is like one of the, the most popular artists among younger people. Uh, and particularly for the lyrics, people get our lyrics tattooed. They live and die by them. And people are hungry for storytelling and, and good lyrics. So I think there is a place for it. And I think that that kind of spot is growing more than ever. And that hole is starting to be filled. I do think for a while, um, and I can't, I can't blame people for wanting to just have something simple and uh, inoffensive or something that might not feel like it challenges them a lot. I think now people are willing to kind of open themselves up to things that challenge a little bit. And I think uh, that, music will find a way to satisfy that need for people. Is there a lyric of yours that you actually think back to to get through something that may be tough or an obstacle? Of my own? Yeah. Yeah, I wrote a song. Um, it hasn't been released called Shape of My Shadow. And then, as I was writing it, it kind of uh, made me start to consider my relationship with food and my relationship with my body. Um, I think I kind of have grappled and I didn't realize it with some uh, body dysmorphia. And as I was writing that song, I started to realize like how real my problem was. Um, the lyric is, you must be healthy because you don't look sick. Um, I think eating disorders and body dysmorphia comes in, you know, so many different forms. And I didn't realize that just because I might not look like a body that has something wrong with it, that doesn't mean that there's not something wrong with my body or the way I look at it. Uh, and so writing that song opened my eyes to how I was feeling about myself and how much I just didn't like the way I looked and the way I ate um, or didn't eat. Um, and it was really hard for me to, to come to terms with that. And that's something I'm still working on. Um, but that was a lyric that opened my eyes up to a problem I had. And I didn't realize I had it until I wrote the song. So how does that begin? Like, do you just sit down and go and that's what flows? Or do you have a realization throughout your day? Like, what is it? I think it's kind of like it really is a, a subconscious thing for me. Um, I'll start writing and, and start realizing like, oh shit, this is something I'm dealing with. And it's 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 honestly like in some ways unhealthy because sometimes the only way I can figure out what the fuck is going on is is when I start to write a song. Like I, I wish I could in my day to day just be like, this is a problem I have. You know, I'm gonna take it to my therapist. I'll take it to my mom or a friend or, or somebody. And um, I don't, a lot of times I don't have that clarity until I'm sitting down with a guitar and, and looking at my feet and playing the songs and the, and the, and the I hear the, the strings and the guitar slap around and I start to, kind of unravel something within myself and um that doesn't happen unless i'm sitting down and playing music and i wish and i hope my hope for myself is that i don't need to you know sit down and make songs to find out what's going on with myself i want to be able to come to those conclusions in my day to day and find a way to deal with them more healthily really yeah That's, so you want to but it works i don't want to say it works i mean like clearly it, the art is benefiting from it right yeah it is and oh, for a long time i was like you know I was like, I need my art is the way I'm going to express myself, and it, it, so many different problems arose from that mindset. Particularly with I need to be on medication, um, 
for my depression and stuff. And for a long time, I was like, if I'm on medication, I'm not going to be able to access that pain and that sadness that helps write my music. And, you know, maybe that's true. And maybe it's easier to write when I'm not on meds. But when I'm not on meds, I'm fucking miserable and I'm binge eating or I'm not eating or I'm sitting around and watching TV all day or scrolling through my social media, comparing myself to everybody all the time or I'm angry or grumpy or hard to be around. And it's like, what's more worth it to me? Is it is it worth it to have a, a song that does well, but I'm fucking miserable? Or um, is there a way I can find out how to be happy and make music? And that's what I'm working on. Balance, right? Yeah, balance. It's all balance. And I'm, I'm finding it out. It's, it's, um, it's a work in progress, for sure. Is it wild that you're finding this balance while also going through probably, I mean, easily the most crazy time in your career yet? It is. And what's nice is that I can live and die by these songs and these songs I know speak to the total truth of what I've been going through. And so that as I'm playing these songs that are finding some success, uh, which I'm so grateful for, I'm able to be proud of the things I said. I don't feel like I'm misrepresenting myself or that, you know, I'm playing a song about something in my life that isn't happening now. Like these are songs about what I'm going through currently and what I was going through a year ago. And it's nice to be able to kind of play them, promote them, come on your show and talk about them, but also feel like they are still true to me and uh, that the themes in them are still things that I believe in and, and am going through. And even the titles, like they're clearly like, uh, in for what I take away is almost like, like memory joggers, like mm -hmm. Halloween or orange juice, like just uh, things that just, or a random item attached to that one d series of situations or one major situation? Yeah. Is that the right way to interpret that? Yeah, I think it's all stories, sometimes stories about different people, like in a song, in or like, like, like Orange Juice, they're two different people in a narrative, or a song like Come Over is not for my voice. Um, yeah, a song like Halloween is about two different people in different places, but they do speak to the themes that are going on in my life, like, you know, Orange Juice struggle with addiction, with with a uh, loss of friendship and come over with insecurity and with Halloween, with being haunted by somebody. Those are things I feel. Um, and I just, I, I, I never want to limit myself to my own, the specifics of my own life. I love the idea of being able to create a world and have it, have a part of me in it. Um, I think it's really cool. There's a lot of freedom in that. So I try to, you know, tell stories, but also make sure the themes are very true to me all the time. Do you, you, you said that, well, one of them was written from, is it imagination or somebody else's story? How do you do it? Yeah, a lot of times I just write from uh, the perspective of somebody I don't know or someone I do know and try to think about what it looks like through their eyes. It's a fun challenge, you know. Uh, Paul Simon, so great at that. Boy in the Bubble, Last last Living Boy in New York. Like, I think a lot of those tunes maybe aren't completely accurate to what he's going through in his life, and maybe they are. Paul Simon stands, don't cancel me, but... Um, <laughs> It seemed like he was creating worlds and creating stories and um, that he had different characters in his life that he accessed through his songwriting. And that's something that I'm really interested in. It's fucking cool. Yeah. Very cool. What are you thinking? What kind of impact do you want this, al this album to have on other people who listen to it as a whole? I think most of all, the thing I struggled with most in the past three years uh, because of the pandemic, because of, you know, I think my aversion to being in the industry is a lot of isolation. Mm -hmm. I feel like... I felt really lonely, not only in Stratford where I was writing the record, but in New York City where I was living. I felt lonely among all these people all the time. And I was like, how do I feel this isolated with these people around me? And how do I deal with these feelings of isolation? And um, I want people who are struggling with that, feeling alone, feeling left behind in life or feeling like their life didn't pan out at the moment the way they thought it was going to be to feel like there is someone else that's going through that and that there isn't a, that there isn't a, um, that they're not alone in those feelings. Um, I want people to feel heard and, and, and I want people to feel lonely to um, to, to feel connected to something because that's what I desperately needed in those times and what a lot of artists provide for me. So I, w I want to provide that for somebody else. Do you feel any of that connection that you were seeking? I do, especially on tour. Like to go out and sing songs that I wrote at really tough times um, and really lonely times and to see thousands of people singing them and, and relating to them. Like it feels it feels comforting to know that other people are connecting to those things. And it's weird. It's like being alone together, um, like being in a crowd and everyone with their full chest sing these lyrics about feeling alone. I'm like you're right next to people and I'm right next to you and we still feel this. And it's, it's kind of sad um, to see people that feel alone in a room full of people. And I've felt that so much in my life. So it makes me feel connected, but it also makes me feel sad for the folks that connect a lot to the music. Cause I know what they're going through. Do you ever fear that a therapist isn't going to understand you like songwriting does? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a kind of a leap of faith that I'd need to take. And um, it's it's like I said earlier, like it's something that I do need. And like it might not feel right all the time the way that songwriting does, but I know in the back of my head it's the right thing to be doing. And um, 
There's also something to be said about, you know, when I'm writing these songs, I know they're going to be released, and, and in a lot of ways they become commodities. And I don't want every feeling of mine to be a commodity or something that's sold or consumed. I want there to be feelings that I have that I just need to discuss with another human being one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so in some ways I am afraid that a therapist might not understand completely, um, but they can try, and I can try to help them understand me, and that's um, kind of part of the, the growing challenge uh and that's something that i'm facing right now for sure and being honest with somebody looking and listening to you as opposed to you being honest in the privacy privacy and sanctity of your own brain and totally notepad you know absolutely yeah there's like two different i think there's two different kinds of honesty like one the songwriting one is much more eloquent and <laughs> you know there's some papering over the cracks and there's some yeah, and refined frills over time. and refinement whereas like with a therapist i'm just sitting there mumbling and rambling and and it's their job to kind of like understand what's happening in between the rambling and, and where the honesty is in that. And um, it's definitely a lot less refined of an honesty, but I think it's an important one to access and to, to look at. Do you think this album has helped you realize that you need to take control of your mental health? Absolutely. Yeah. This album was one of the first things in the past few years in music that has made me happy. And I was like, this is something that makes me happy. I needed to continue to pursue that not only in music but in my personal life and my and my the way I take care of my body and the way I treat people around me like I need to do things that I know make me happy and that move me forward as a person um less so than looking at things that are going to bring me success or perceived success like it has to be everything I, I need to be intentional about taking care of myself because this is going to be my job I think for so long I felt like I'll probably only do this for a couple of years and I'll fall off and go get a college and go get a job somewhere else but I'm like I think I might have you know, fucking knock on this nice tree trunk you guys have here. Um, <laughs> I think there is like a career and a future for me in music still that might be longer than I thought it was going to be. And so I need to find a way to exist in this space healthily um, and with a clear head if I'm going to be able to do this job. Because, I mean, you guys know how much this industry can fucking spin you out and take you around and, and fuck you up. And so if I'm going to be in it, I want to be doing it in a way that's, you know, safe. Does having real cash now help in this? Yeah, dude. Like, yeah, I'm gonna get my jawline messed with. I'll get a nose job. But this, and yeah, <laughs> we'll see you next year. You'll be a different person. Yeah, yeah dude. I'm Fabio a, comes in here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, man. Having like the the security of like, okay, like I'm I'm able to tour. Shows are selling out. I'm able to fly to LA. I'm able to go travel and to have some the privilege of having money in this industry is not lost on me. Like, I am very grateful for that, and it allows me to feel like I can make. The music I want to make and in besides money just the capital of trust is mm. just as important trust oh, yeah. from the label trust from the people my band trust that, from my management that's freedom that is freedom more so in my opinion than financial freedom is in music is the freedom of of trust and belief that I have had to work for um, because it's it's a scary proposition for a label to hear an artist go like hey I've made like kind of more pop folk stuff for a long time and I've gone into sessions with big songwriters and we've worked with big producers and and to be like I'm gonna sit at my dad's house and look out the fucking window and smoke weed and make us a, a record and like that's just what I'm gonna do it takes a lot of trust uh, from from people that are data driven to trust your heart um, and they did and I'm really grateful for that you hear all these horror stories about labels not letting you do what you want but I really do I'm just gonna shill for my label here but they've just given me a lot of freedom and trust and that trust has you know compounded with the success of this record and that's been the thing I'm most grateful for is the opportunity to continue making the music that I love oh yeah and a long-standing relationship like you've been signed since 2017 yeah they picked me up when I was a senior in high school and I haven't been with anybody else my perspective is limited I haven't been with another label um, and it's been a really cool relationship where I feel like there has been a lot of trust and faith and uh, that's something that I is, that is not lost. I'm excited to have so many friends that has been fucked over by different labels and I'm like, wow, I hope that doesn't happen to me and it, and it really hasn't. Would you ever go back to working in like a big studio in a major city with these big name writers or are you just super comfortable in you know, your, your parents' garage in New England? Yeah, that's the journey right now. It's like I'm trying to figure out um, what's next and if I, I want to go back to doing that. I And I, got, I feel like in some of the press stuff I've been doing, I feel like I've kind of been like, I don't want people to perceive it as a slight towards these incredible fucking talented genius writers have gotten to work with these genius producers these genius industry folks that have you know kind of created this career for me in a lot of ways um i've been so grateful for those experiences i think it just came down to what i needed for myself at the time and i'm still figuring out what's needed next you know with the success of this thing it's hard to not be like i'm just gonna go back to my dad's house and make some music hang out with my dad's dog and my dog and it's hard to like not want to do that again but i think it's one of those things where to get to this record it took a lot of random 
things happening. So I think there's going to be some more random occurrences and and correspondences and um, events that lead me to the next thing. And I'm trying not to focus on how that's going to happen quite yet. Yeah, like why would you rush to even do it? Yeah, you, yeah, you can't rush. You can't rush these things. But also, just keep doing what you do. You make music all the time. Yeah, it's it is come. It does come down to just writing every day. If yeah. I'm writing every day, no, it'll the present songs itself. Will Fuck yeah. Yeah, man. What are you thinking? When you write these songs, does it help solve the problem or does it just bring the problem to light? Like you mentioned growing sideways. Do you still push all your problems to the side or is you found a way to kind of tackle them head on? I do, but I don't think I would have written a song like growing sideways a few years ago. So I think it's kind of like it brings them to the forefront and then I have to choose whether or not I want to deal with them. Cause I, like I said, I know it's the truth. Like I, I hear this when I hear a song and when I put a song out, it is the truth. Like that is what's going on. And, um, Knowing that that's the truth is powerful because it allows you to choose whether you want to deal with it or not. Um, and I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse than singing a song like Growing Sideways and knowing that you're still in that place. Uh, I've been there with a few songs and it sucks to be like, these are painful lyrics and I actually haven't gotten through it. So there's no perspective on it. It's just wallowing in it and playing it every day and seeing people say like, oh my God, like this song helped me get through the death of my friend or this song helped me get through my own issues with my mental health and to know that people are hearing your lyrics and growing from them, but you're not actually growing from your own music is scary and really tough. Um, so I try to challenge myself to listen to what I'm saying and act on it. That's, it's so interesting. I've never even heard that ever said. Yeah. Wow. Like, Fuck like, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Could have turned into an NFT then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that whole thing crashed though. I, you're not gonna oh, true. Yeah, never mind. I Fuck hear that. they're doing real well right <laughs> Yeah, I just threw all my life savings and my new uh, publishing deal into FTX, so hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> God, I hope that's not true. No, 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 no. no. Absolutely not, dude. <laughs> I mean, do you listen to your, th this album and think this could last forever or what? I don't think anything lasts forever, but I think it's going to give me a little more runway and I'm going to try to enjoy every fucking second of it, man. You got it. These things come and go. And I've seen when I had hurt somebody and I was here last, man, I was like, I don't need to do anything. Like I got this tune. Like I'm going to be doing all this. I got Julian Michaels in this song. I recorded it with Joel Little. Like I'm going to be the shit. And that was like the biggest mistake in my life to think that because a couple years later, you know, I've never struggled. I've never been like completely lost in, in the industry. I don't think I've always had support and fans coming to the shows and but I did feel like I needed to get myself back into the into the space and back in front of people's eyes and ears. And uh, it was scary feeling like that, feeling like I didn't know what my next step was. And, and now that I feel like I'm having this moment, I'm trying to like be grateful for it at every second I can and like remember that I'm being given this opportunity to write music that means something to me and, um, and having it have success, which is really rare. Uh, so I'm definitely not taking it for granted. And I'm hoping that it continues to bring me success, but if it doesn't, I'm going to be grateful for the success it has brought me so far. Why was Stick Season the right name for the album? Yes, I Stick Season is a term that I have been hearing my whole life from like older neighbors and my parents' friends about November in Vermont, and November in New England, um, but really a native term to Vermont. Uh, and as I kind of wrote this record and it started to feel like it was a record about New England, uh, the term Stick Season just felt perfect because it is a time of transition. It's a time of change and for me, a lot of sorrow. This time of year is fucking gnarly back home. I mean, you mm. guys know it's the leaves are off the trees. It's cold and gray. It's not like dude, snow. It's polar not pretty. vortex. It's, you're dodging them. Yeah, dude. Exactly. It's gross. It's grim. You're waking up and you're like I said, just warming your car up all morning. And um, it's a time that really felt like it encapsulated the vibe of the record. This kind of like colder, uh, lonely feeling. Um, and I felt like the term stick season is really, really just a catchy, cool little term. Um, but also something that could bring people to what Vermont is. Mm. Uh, Vermont is a place that people that aren't from New England think is in Canada, or they think <laughs> Bernie Sanders is the king of Vermont, and that there's Subaru Outbacks everywhere, which actually is true. Ben um, and Jerry's? Ben and Jerry's, right? And then they think fish. Then I'm like, there's a lot more going on here, and it's teddy not all bears. good. Teddy bears. Teddy bears are there. Yeah, t yeah, build a bear, fish, <laughs> Bernie Sanders. There's a store that only sells flannel. Yeah, uh -oh. dude. If you don't, you actually, there's like a... There. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, dude. If you're not wearing flannel in Vermont, they rip that shit off you and throw, <laughs> throw one on for you, man. Um, but that's what people think. You know, people, and then there is truth in that, but they're also like, it's a state with its problems and its challenges like mm -hmm. any other. And I wanted to show people what Vermont is, is like and what New England is like. There's no billboards. No billboards in Vermont, which is good, man. Those shit. things are so fucking distracting. Especially out here, it's like, you're going to hell. And I'm like, I'm just trying to drive and listen to, <laughs> <laughs> listen to Bill Simmons, dude. Like, why do I have to be faced with eternity right now on the 405? There's no billboards in Vermont? Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah, really? there was some law that passed a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually trying to change that. I just want to get my face on every exit <laughs> sign. <laughs> 
I'm sure they'd love it. <laughs> yeah, they might. They might. <laughs> I love Vermont, by the way. I really do. Burlington, we've been to a, a few times. Oh, that's been, awesome. I've been to Ben and Jerry's a couple times. Nice. We were on the radio up there for a while. Not Triple X, but uh, WXEO. Where in Vermont? Stafford, right? Stratford, yeah. So I grew up uh, like border Vermont, New Hampshire. So I lived in Hanover, New Hampshire for a lot of my okay. life. Stratford, Vermont. Live free or die. Uh, live free or die. Yeah, very different vibes, which is why I kind of like <laughs> usually like lean towards the Vermont side. Like, <laughs> yeah. Vermont is like very liberal, and New Hampshire is like, oh, fuck. Literally, you, they, you don't need to wear a fucking seatbelt. They don't give a shit. Yeah, it, it, yeah. But it's they like, are nice people. I got to give it to them. Super nice. And it's so beautiful. New Hampshire is so beautiful. Yeah, it is. But but, uh, and in the fall, oh my God, the leaves! Oh my gosh, yeah, dude! All yeah, the leaves in Vermont and New Hampshire, the foliage in the summer and the in the late fall is just so gorgeous. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's. I grew up in both places, but Vermont, I feel like it's where I've found a lot of myself. I feel like growing up, I kind of wasn't sure who I was, and then after kind of living in Vermont was where I really started to discover what I was about and and uh, take stock of those things. So it's what I connect with the most for sure. You gotta listen to Stick Season. It, obviously, it's available on Amazon Music. We're gonna put a link in the description below. It, you are on tour, right? Yeah, we actually just finished our tour last night. Oh fuck! Yeah, okay, we're doing Jimmy mind. Kimmel tomorrow. Um, we did. Uh, finished our first leg last night. We go back out again in January. Oh six! So you can buy tickets still. Well, they're all sold out. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Jokes nice. on you. Move faster. Yeah, and the resale prices are fucking insane. So are we gonna up? Like, are we gonna scale up in venue or what? Yeah. So we're planning some stuff for uh, the rest of the year. Some with them, some upgrades, which is really cool. Um, what a great problem to have, by the way. It's amazing, and we've had the opposite problem where it's like we have to scale down <laughs> or just fucking we can't even play this city because there's 14 people that are going to come. And I'm grateful for those 14, but it's very nice to have venues full of people and uh, to have, you know, the opportunity to, like, upgrade and to sell shows out in cities that I've never been to before. It's pretty awesome. You should be incredibly proud of yourself. Thank you so much. No. I, I'm, I'm very grateful for you guys. Thank you for having me. Well, in. dude, this is a, one of my favorite albums Knock on wood that stays in like my top five category, maybe top three. Hell yeah. I, really incredible songs, like truly honest and really something. I've been listening to your music forever. And I remember I've said to Dan like a thousand times, I was like, this motherfucker wrote a thousand plus songs to get this one fucking song. Yeah, man. And this one fucking song, easily, I, the Julia Michael song is whatever. Fuck, this changed your life. Yeah, this just changed my life. Everything else, no offense, it was something, but it was not. This is where it was leading. This, yeah, it was leading to this moment. I'm going to retire, dude. I don't want to do anything else. This is the stuff I'm definitely <laughs> it, the most proud of. But that is scary, right? It is scary. It's been like one of those, I'll find a problem out of the greatest situation ever. And like the one problem I have found is like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do next because I am so obsessed with this record. You know, we are actually doing a deluxe. So I'm able to kind of live in the world a little bit more. Cool. But it's scary to think about what's next when I'm so attached to this stuff. And really, really the first time I've been like so proud of anything that I've made. But as somebody who is genuinely a fan, like really with every fiber of my being, you may be one of my most listened to artists on my Spotify wrapped. Can't Hell yeah. Um, Make sure like, you post that Instagram story. I'll give you a little repost, smiling face emoji. <laughs> I got you, brother. But just kidding. I only listen to Amazon music. I don't Oh, listen to fuck. Spotify. Sorry. I'm yeah. Kidding, that's is Amazon me. completed? What is it? Uh, <laughs> do they do like a rap thing? Whatever it is, I'll <laughs> that's post. That's what you use. I'll okay. I'll share it. Yeah. Um, uh, you are really one of my most listened to artists, definitely of the year. It, it, I don't know the secret of keeping going, but don't fucking rush anything because you don't need to rush. And I think great art actually takes time to fucking, it needs time to marinate. And if you distract so quickly, people aren't going to know. And I think there'll be, there'll be some people out there who makes the, make the case of like, oh, but if you have another big song, then they'd find mm -hmm. all these others. Fuck that. You already have a thick enough discography of great music that once they stumble upon Stick Season or Sideways or Northern Attitude, they're going to find the album. They're going to find everything else you have. Don't fucking rush. Take time. Say it with your chest, man. Thank you. It's, I needed to hear that. Thank it, you. It's so, I mean, God, like this shit only, genius, even though you're trying every day, genius doesn't knock every day. Mm -hmm. And you have an album of a lot of genius songs. So You know what Afro Man once said? You only I'm desperate to hear. You only need one hit to have a long career. Hell yeah. Even Fuck I yeah, Afro Man. Even I, yes, well, you have a lot of hits. I'm just saying that's yes what Afro Man no. said. I, well, that's, a, you know, there's a time and place for Afro Man. Yeah. But like, I and don't that know. time is now. That <laughs> place is here. I guess. <laughs> um, but, I, thank you. Oh, no, go ahead. Did you, were you going to say something? I was just going to say thank you. That's just it's incredibly kind and really means a lot. So thank you very much. No, nah, dude, it's, uh, uh, I'm telling 100% the truth and you, no bullshit. Everybody can confirm and it's... Dude, it's really fucking cool, and I'm so happy that this is my favorite type of music. So to see this type of music out there and doing what it does, uh, it yeah, very fucking exciting. Thank you, my friend. Very exciting. Uh, you did say like two years ago you almost deleted Stick Season off of TikTok. Why? What made you keep it there? 
Uh, despite my confident demeanor, I'm actually pretty insecure. And I was like, like everybody else, I was really living and dying by like engagement and comments and stuff. And I posted the song and like, it didn't, you know, TikTok, like it's kind of like a time game sometimes. And mm -hmm. I wasn't like seeing the immediacy and I was like, shoot, like, is this not good? And I really almost deleted it. And then I woke up the next morning or, and, or whatever, or whenever it was. And it was like blowing up. It was like, oh my God, this is working. And it did give me a lot of confidence. And I hate having to rely on some external, you know, praise to kind of, make me believe in something but it's at human. that moment it's what I needed um, and it helped do you think if you would have taken it down the song may have never come out I don't think I ever would have thought about it again I think I would have wow. not put it out I would have gone back to the studio the next morning and recorded my record yeah, and are made you another afraid record. that there's more stick seasons just collecting dust somewhere that you are you just can't hear it or see it right away yeah I am I, I have been but I recently I've been like I gotta trust those songs. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna send every song. I'm gonna post every song. I'm gonna send it to my manager, to my label. Like I, I have to. I'm gonna try to believe and champion my music more because that's what got me here. And I need to, I need to remember that formula. At what point was there a point in this journey, like just as a musician, where you despise TikTok? Of course, yeah. And some days I do still. Um, I, but I, but I realize like it is a tool, and if you use it in a way that's appropriate, you can have a lot of success. I think. It's a matter of not buying into it totally, not letting it consume you and your self-worth. That's something I've been working with as well, is just not letting the success of a video determine how my day is going to go. Uh, TikTok is, there's so much we could talk about with it. Um, and there's so much good that it's done for so many artists and some of my favorite artists I've found on TikTok. And I've also seen artists that I know are incredible musicians not have success on it. It requires you to be somewhat self-promoting and a little bit air ego -tist, ego driven totally. where it's like here's me here's why you should look at me and uh, that can be dangerous and some people don't like to access that but still make great music and they're not getting the shine they need but I do think it is bringing great songs to the forefront and I think that's awesome to uh, give people a chance to show their music and to find music that's great that means something to them that changes their lives uh, because of a fucking clock app on your phone that's pretty sweet <laughs> please listen to stick season there's gonna be a link in the description below you can listen to it wherever you stream music but i highly recommend you go to amazon music are we gonna release our own version of strawberry wine or what i'm down i think there's something there Let's also i've never had a strawberry wine so i'm fucking down you know, to try I, do they even mix i don't have a nice strawberry wine either. do it Let's I like it. fruity shit that right. gets me drunk. Let's go get shit faced. So was it like it's like one eight, one p.m. I think we're good. I think that's actually the, <laughs> one p.m. on a Monday. I think that's the right time to get fun. <laughs> Hell yeah, <laughs> rock on. Final thoughts. Was Stick Season nominated for a Grammy or was it not out in time? Because if it was, like, why didn't it get nominated? Um, so the song Stick Season we did submit. I did not uh, receive a nomination, but I'm hoping for the next Kids Choice Awards. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the album is uh, it will be eligible next year. I'm, God, man, I don't even care. I, I would I would be so grateful and it'd be so cool. But it's another thing like that thing's not gonna make me any more happy than just playing the show. So I'm trying to enjoy the moment. And you know, if you guys have a vote in the Grammy committee, you know, throw my throw one my way. If you have a vote in the Nick's Kids Choice Award, start loading the slime up into the barrels, dude. <laughs> Start engraving that blimp. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, start engraving that fucking, <laughs> fucking deep orange. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it is a kaleidoscope. The blimp. You can look into it. Really? Do you have one? Uh, I worked for Nickelodeon for four years. Oh, and sweet. I no, I don't have one because fuck you, Nickelodeon. <laughs> but I've been slimed a bunch, and I've given them to What's people. What's in the slime? Uh, th so the original slime was actually like an applesauce mixture thing. It oh. was somewhat edible. Yeah. Uh, but the current one, well, current, I don't know, this is like a 20, when was the last time I slimed somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Tea. it. I mean, the real question is, when's the last time I was slimed? Yeah. <laughs> Far more recently than me sliming them. Um, oh, an adult uh, joke. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, probably like uh, 2000, oh God, fuck, 12 maybe? 11? No, 12. Take me back. So whatever that recipe was in 2012, it was like a thick goo, uh, mm. but still watery enough because there was, but there are different types of slime. There's slime that gets tossed on you, like at the Kids' Choice Award, then there's slime that you like would swim through or have to walk through. Different consistency. Got it. Yeah. yeah, I would like to talk to some of the scientists behind that and just find out what their internet search history looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll connect you with somebody. Cool. Listen to Six Season, please. There's a link in the description below. Amazon Music, it is there for you. You good? One more question. Yeah. When you have a song like Mess, good song, do you not enjoy it? Do you not feel connected to it? Or is that just like something in your past? I, I do still feel connected to Mess. Um, 
I think it kind of is one of those songs, like the songs like we were saying earlier, that did feel like it was leading up to some of the Stixies and stuff. It's got that anthemic, some yeah. storytelling in it, and I definitely still relate to the themes. I feel like I've moved past the point in my life where I like need to go home to like get away from everything. Um, but it does still feel pertinent and and uh, relatable to what I'm going through now. And you know, there's a thing. There's something to be said for just songs that make the fans so happy. Like that's a big part of it. Just seeing people smile and like, that song makes people smile. I'll play it as long as people want to hear it. That's healthy. A lot of people don't want to do that. I know. know. Well, yeah, I'll do whatever the fuck people tell me to do really at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why you're going to keep working. And that's, <laughs> that's exciting. Why you're right in this business. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Stick Season from Noah Khan. Link in the description below. Thanks for hanging out, man. Thank you, guys. Truly, really, thank you so much. Noah Khan, everybody. Woo! All right, cool.